A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Now that I have your attention, I want to tell you a story. I'm really sorry, it's not that kind of story. It's a story about scholarship of teaching and learning, or SOTO. It's a story we are all part of, we are all participating in. And SOTO is the story that helps us move, develop, push the field of learning and teaching in higher education further, of coming up with new ideas, of establishing best practice and offering our students the best learning experience we can offer. But let's start at the beginning. Sotl has many definitions, but I only have 20 minutes. Thank you, organizers. So I can't really go in depth into these definitions. However, I want to explore three different words or terms that are commonly used and sometimes used as a misnomer when talking about the scholarship of teaching and learning. So the first one is scholarship. Very often I find colleagues use the term scholarship when they are actually speaking about SOTO, about the scholarship of teaching and learning. Now there is a bit of a problem with that and there is a bit of a problem because I still think SOTO is a misnomer. However, that's what we are stuck with. So we have to work with it. And we just need to be clear about the differences in terminology. Scholarship is if I engage in someone else's ideas, work, research, think about it, write about it myself. Then we have scholarly. So scholarly is what you may maybe know as evidence-informed practice. So scholarly is if I want to plan something in my teaching. I want to change a course, or I want to introduce flipped classroom, or I might be thinking about gamifying virtual labs. And I go out and have a look at other people's publications. So that would be a scholarly approach to my practice. You might wonder, what does this actually have to do with SOTO? Well, and this is where the next steps come in. I think a good way of thinking about the question of, well, is my work worthwhile publishing, is to think about who would benefit from your voice. Because never forget your voice is important. Your experience is important. Your journey is important. It is important in becoming the educator you want to be. And this is a permanently developing, self-emerging process. And your journey is important. Initially, you may have done something that may only be important at local level, or it may be important for your whole college or your whole university. It might be important for the sector, for the field, for your discipline. So there are different levels of significance there. But your voice is important. So think about who would benefit from it? Let's say you have implemented a creative practice. And I'm an experienced educator. And this piece of writing you have shared about you implementing this new practice may or may not be something new to me. Because education is a vast field. And it draws from so many different disciplines. So education draws from psychology, from neuro and cognition sciences, behavioral sciences, from social sciences, from the humanities, from philosophy, from education itself, because education itself has a vast array of sub-disciplines. So there is a good chance that I don't know yet, but I might. Fair enough, but I might not be an experienced educator. I may just have had my first year teaching in higher education. I may have inherited a course and material from someone and I don't know where to even begin. So I'm in this vast space that is education and I'm sitting in my little space glider and I'm looking at the map and I have no idea where to start. 
So I'm just hitting the search engines or the databases and I'll find your paper. And that paper was exactly what I needed at this stage of my journey because you have been at that stage yourself and you've learned something and you shared something. And this may help me to understand where to go. It may help me to understand which way to steer my space glider and I finally have a direction. It may help me to access things I've never accessed before, to think about my teaching practice in a completely different way. So yes, your voice is important, just be very clear what your audience might be, who your audience might be. Yeah, you didn't think we were there yet, right? I have 20 minutes. So let's recap. You've done it. You kind of sort of know what scholarship is. You know, I hope, what scholarly means. And you have an inkling possibly what scholarship of teaching and learning may be. You have changed your practices based on something you've read and you may have written about it, maybe a blog post or a small practice paper. And now you want to move further because you want to collect data. You want to actually evidence your practice. And instead of having evidence informed scholarly practice, you want evidence based practice where you collect data, you evaluate what you're doing. So <laughs> all well and good, but where do we start? And unfortunately, I'm really, really sorry. My most commonly used answer to this question is, it depends on, I'm sorry, it's not getting any better here. It depends on, it depends on what you want to know. What is it you want to look at? What is it you want to explore? And Social science can be really tricky to get your head around, particularly when you're from a non-cognitive discipline, because there is barely a situation where there is a right or wrong answer. It is about your viewpoints. It is about the questions you have. And these questions, existing literature and your questions, will determine how you go about with your social project. And that whole process would be an entirely different talk, if not several, actually. But there is a problem. You can now leave your little space collider because you've done the scholarly thing and you can enter the big space ship because you have more stuff now. You have more luggage. You've done the reading. You've maybe participated in a couple of conferences. And you change into a big spaceship. Now, there's an issue. The warning lights go on. Red alarm, a meteor is about to hit us. Because, or a bit of space debris, maybe an old satellite. Anyway, warning lights are on because you want to collect data but you forgot to apply for ethics. I'm sorry, that bit of space debris is gonna hit your spaceship and it crashes. You survive, don't worry, but you need a new spaceship. So one of the most commonly asked questions after, well, where do I start, is when do I need ethics? The rule of thumb is, if you collect data from learners or colleagues, you will need ethics. However, this is not the same as needing consent. So students in European institutions as well usually sign a data sharing agreement when they enter the institution. So it might be that you just want to look into specific data like grade mark progressions or something that <clears throat> the students have agreed to share anyway. However, while you may not necessarily need consent for that, you will need ethics because you have to demonstrate to the ethics committee or the ethics board 
that you're using the data in an ethical way, that your intentions are ethical, and that the way you want to talk about it and write about it is done ethically. So you need ethics for this. If you collect data from your students and from your colleagues, you need ethics, even if this is data that falls under data sharing agreements. So we've all been there, right? Where we implemented something, a small change in activity, maybe we changed one of the lectures, maybe we changed one session or even a whole course, and we didn't think it would be a big deal. And then halfway through the semester realize, I would have had beautiful data from this. It has such a positive impact. Now, what do I do? You cannot use any data from your students. So it's not all lost yet, bear with me. You can't use any comments from the students. You can't use anything they've produced, said, done to evidence your practice. However, you can share a reflective practice piece. So you can share your thinking and planning of that activity. If it was really successful, think about, well, what made it successful? What was it you did? What literature did you base this on? Um, do you have any reading, any references, any resources you consulted before implementing the change? Or was it an idea that came to you when you were talking to a colleague and you just wanted to try it out because you just wanted to experiment? Now, and it worked, and that is fantastic. So share your story, go back to the literature, look what other people have done, share your thinking and planning process. You can even do things like use the National Teaching Repository and share teaching material or templates you develop um, publicly. So this is one way of moving your scholarly approach to your teaching into scholarship, even though you forgot the ethics. But what you then can do is you can finish your paper and say, if I do this again next year, I apply for ethics and then I can dig a bit deeper to figure out, well, why did it work? What made it work? The next bit needs to start with an onboard security announcement to your spaceship. This is going to be painful. Bear with me, you'll survive, but it's not going to be easy. Your spaceship is special. It can fly into black holes. Bear with me, okay? It's a story, right? Into the black holes in education, or rather in our teaching practice. If you wish, you can also use the metaphor of dark corners you want to poke with a stick, if that is more believable. Anyway, scholarship of teaching and learning isn't just about the things that worked well. It is about the things that go bump. It is about something that you can't quite grasp. You know that one lecture or that one lab or that one seminar or even a whole course where no matter what you try, it just doesn't quite work and you can't figure it out and you end up actually not looking forward to teaching that specific session. These are the black holes. These are the dark corners in our teaching practice. And there's a secret. They're painful to look at because it is painful to look in the mirror, but there's a lot of learning in these unknown spaces. And I think it can be painful because of something I am now making a sweeping assumption about. You are all here, you joined Weisweg, and my sweeping assumption is that you care, that you care about your teaching practice, about your students, about your professional identity. And this care is what makes it so painful to look into these dark corners and learn from them. I don't know about you, but I can get course feedback and it can be absolutely brilliant. And I have one student who said something negative and the next three months, I'll be rolling this negative comment in my head every day, probably several times a day. And you have to 
really be confident to look in these corners. But this is where communities like, like you have here at this conference are so important. They can help you to stay safe when you look into the things that don't work. They are your support network. They can help you to join in your spaceship and fly into the black holes. So make use of this. Make use of this learning from one another and help each other to look at the things that go bump, even if that's painful. I have one question and one challenge for you to finish this off. The first question, mm -hmm. questions, yeah, is what is knowledge and how is it created? I know you're not philosophers, but I would assume many of you may be such inclined. So one of the things I notice when I review papers, when I review sort of projects, I keep seeing again and again and again as a method, questionnaire, focus groups, questionnaire, focus groups. I need to say there is nothing fundamentally wrong with these methods. Okay, however, what we do when we create specific methods, we create a filter. Have you ever filled in one of these customer service questionnaires where you have Likert scale answers or, or you have choose three out of five or please rank from one to six? And you look at the answers and you go, actually, none of them quite fit what I actually think. And what happens is by the sign of the questionnaire, there are filters built in. There are filters of what the researchers can know from that questionnaire. And so in education, if you want to have the voices of your learners, think about how you design your subtle projects. Any questionnaire we develop will inevitably create a filter, particularly if you're using quantitative questionnaires with a specific range of answers we have chosen that range of answers. We are making presumptions about possible answers. Yes, they may be based on our experience, but our experience is biased. It's inevitably biased. So one of the things I would like you to think about and maybe explore and take up a couple of papers or a book is think about participatory research methods or creative research methods. Maybe collaborate with your learners on how they want to help you generate that understanding, generate that knowledge. And you might be surprised with answers. So if we change how we inquire, we change the knowledge we get, and we challenge these notions and these power structures that are behind knowledge creation. I have a challenge for you now to close off this presentation. And I've just noticed it, two challenges. Sorry about this. Um, think beyond your discipline. I know to some degree you're already doing this here in Weisweg, which is fantastic. But go further, challenge your boundaries because how we make sense of this world, how we learn, how our brains process information, how we negotiate meaning with one another is not discipline specific. Yes, methods of delivery, methods of teaching, processes of delivery may, but don't necessarily have to be discipline specific. But the processes behind that, the principles of this meaning making, of this knowledge creation, of this ethical co-construction of knowledge, these are not discipline specific. There is much learning in other spaces. And so this is my last challenge. Go find another colleague who is so far away from your own discipline and talk to them about teaching and learning and how they help their students to make sense of this world. Thank you for your time.